Hi, I'm Trevor Hasty. And I'm Rob Tipsharani. Hi. I'm Rob. And then you say, Welcome to the course in Cisco. Hi, I'm Trevor Hasty. And I'm Rob Tip. Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm Trevor. No, I'm Rob Tipsharani. And I'm Trevor Hasty. And welcome to our course on statistical learning. This is the first online course we've ever, we've ever given, and we're really excited to tell you about it. And a little nervous, as you can hear. So, uh, by way of background, what is statistical learning? Um, Trevor and I are both statisticians. We were actually graduate students here at Stanford in the 80s. We've known each other for about 30 years. Oh, my goodness. And uh, back then, uh, well, we did applied statistics like a lot of statisticians did. St statistics have been around since about 1900 or before. Um, but in the 1980s, people in, in computer science developed the field of machine learning. Uh, especially neural networks became a very hot topic. I was at University of Toronto and Trevor was at Bell Labs. And one of the first neural networks was developed at Bell Labs to solve the, the zip code uh, recognition problem, which we'll show you a little bit about in, in, in a few slides. So around, the, around that time, uh, Trevor and I and then some colleagues, Jerry Friedman, uh, Brad Efron. Uh, Leo Bryan. Leo uh, Bryman. And you actually, you'll, you'll hear from Jerry and Brad both in, in this course. We have uh, some, some interviews with them. About that time, we started to work on the area of machine learning and sort of developed our own view of it, which was, is now called statistical learning. So we're one of the, along with our colleagues here at Stanford and other places, we developed this field of statistical learning. So in this course, we'll talk to you about some of the developments in this area and give lots of examples. So let's start with our first example, which is um, a computer program playing Jeopardy called Watson that IBM built. Um, and it, it, it beat, uh, the players in a, in a three-game match, and the, 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 the people at IBM who developed the system said it was really a triumph of machine learning. There were a, a lot of very smart technology, both hardware, but also the software and the algorithms were based on machine learning. So this was a, um, a watershed moment, I think, for the area of, of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Google is, is a big user of data and a big analyzer of data. And uh, here's a quote that came in the New York Times in 2009 from Hal Varian, who's the chief economist at, at Google. You can see the quote there, I keep saying that the sexy job in the next 10 years will be statisticians. And indeed, there's a picture of Carrie Grimes, who was a graduate from Stanford Statistics. She was one of the first statisticians hired at Google. Now Google has many statisticians. Our next example, this is a picture of Nate Silver on the right. Nate is a, has a master's in economics, but he calls himself a statistician. Uh, and he writes, he, at least he did write a blog called 538 for the New York Times. And in, the, in that blog, along, uh, he, he predicted the outcome of the 2012 presidential and, and Senate elections uh, very, uh, very well. Matter of fact, he got all this, the, 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 the Senate races right and the, uh, the, the presidential election he, he predicted very, very accurately using statistics, using carefully, uh, carefully sampled data from various places, some careful analysis. He did an extremely accurate job of, of predicting the election when a, a lot of places were a lot of news outlets weren't sure who was going to win. Pretty nerdy looking guy, isn't he, Rob? Yes, but he's very famous. and uh, He's like a rock star <laughs> these days. Yes, yeah, so we, we joke about when you're a statistician, when you go to a party and tell, someone says, well, you know, what do you do? And we say, I'm a statistician. They, they run for the door, right? But nowadays <laughs> we can say, well, we do machine learning. And uh, well, they still run for the door, but it take a little longer to get there. In fact, we now call ourselves data scientists. It's a trendier word. So we're going to run through a number of uh, statistical learning problems. Um, you can see it, there's a bunch of examples on this page, and we'll go through them one by one just to give you a flavor of what's, what sorts of problems we're going to um, be thinking about. So the first, the first data set we're going to look at is on prostate uh, cancer. This is a, a relatively small data set, 97 uh, uh, men, sampled from uh, 97 men with prostate cancer, actually by a Stanford uh, um, physician, Dr. Stamey, in the late 80s. And what we have is the PSA measurement for each uh, subject, along with an, a number of uh, clinical and, and blood measurements from the patients. Some measurements on the cancer itself, and, and some measurements from, uh, from the blood. Um, the measurements to do with cancer size and the, 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 the severity of the cancer. And this is a scatterplot matrix which, which actually show the, shows the data. And you see on the diagonal is the name of each of the variables. And each little plot is a pair of variables. So you get, in one picture, if you've got a, a relatively small number of variables, you can see all the data at once in, in a picture like this. And you can see the nature of the data, what variables are correlated, and so on. And so this is a good way of, of, of getting a view of your data. And uh, in this particular case, the, 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 the goal was to try and predict the PSA from, from the other measurements. So it's along the top. And you can see there's some correlations between these measurements. 
Um, here's actually another view of these data, um, which um, looks rather similar, except in, in the one instance over here, which is, this is the log weight. These variables are on the log scale. And this is log weight. And you notice there's a point over here. It looks like somewhat of an outlier. Well, it turns out on the log scale, it looks a bit like an outlier. But when you, when you look on the normal scale, it, it's enormous. And basically, that was a typo. And um, that would say, if, if that was a real measurement, it would say that uh, a patient, this particular patient, would have a, um, a, a 449-gram uh, prostate. Well, we got an, a message from a, a retired urologist Dr. Stephen Link, who pointed this out to us, and, and so um, we corrected an earlier published version of this, of this scatter plot. Which is a good thing to remember. The first thing to do when you get a, a set of data for analysis is not to run it through a fancy algorithm. Make some graphs, some plots. Look at the data. I think in the old days, before computers, people did that much more because it was, it was easy. I mean, you do it by hand, and the analysis took many, many hours. So people would look first at the data much more, and we needed to keep remember that, that even with big data, you should look at it first before you, you jump in with an analysis. So the next example is um, phonemes um, for, for two vowel sounds. And this is looking at, that this graph has the a log periodograms of, uh, for two different phonemes, the power at different frequencies for two different phonemes, uh, A, A, A and AO. How do you pronounce those, Trevor? AA is odd and AO is ought. So as you can tell, Trevor talks funny, but hopefully during the course you'll be able to. Well, how uh, would you say it, no? <laughs> odd and ought? OK. okay. So, uh, the, the, you see the, the log period, periodograms at various frequencies of, of um, these two vowel sounds are spoken by different people, the orange and the green. And the goal here is to try to classify the two vowel sounds based on the power at different frequencies. So on the bottom, we see uh, a logit model has been fit to the, the, the data, looking at trying to, to classify the two classes from each other based on the, the power at different frequencies. The loaded model is from logistic regression, right. which is used to, to classify into one of the two vowel sounds based right. on, the, on the, the log periodogram. And we'll cover it in detail in the course. And the, the, the uh, coefficients, the estimated coefficients from the, the logistic model are in the, the gray uh, profiles here in the bottom plot. And you can see uh, they're very non-smooth. You'd be hard pressed to, to tell where the important frequencies were. But when you apply a kind of smoothing, which we'll also discuss in the course, which we'll, we'll use the fact that the nearby frequencies should be similar, right, which the, the, uh, the gray did not exploit, we get the red curve. And the red curve shows you pretty clearly that the important frequencies looks like um, the one vowel sound's got more power around 25, and the other vowel sound has more power around just before 50. Predict whether someone will have a heart attack on the basis of demographic diet and clinical measurements. So these are some data on, on actually men from South Africa. The red ones are, are those that had heart disease and the blue points are those that didn't. It's a case control sample. So all the heart attack cases were, were taken as cases and a sample of the controls were made. And the idea was to understand the risk factors um, in, in heart disease. Now, when you have a binary response like this, you can color the scatter plot matrix to, so you can see the points, which is, is rather handy. And these, these data come from a region of South Africa where the, heart, the risk of heart uh, disease is very high. It's over 5% uh, over for this age group. The people, the, 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 especially men around, they eat lots of, uh, these were men, um, they eat lots of meat. They have meat for all three meals. And in fact, meat's so prevalent Chicken's regarded as a vegetable. <laughs> Poor chicken. Rob loves that okay. joke. <laughs> I used to love that joke. Okay. So again, you can see there's <laughs> correlations in these data. And, uh, and the goal here is to, is to filter, fit a model that jointly involves all these different risk factors in, in coming up with a risk model for, for heart disease, which in this case is, is, is um, as I said, colored in, in red. Our next example is uh, email spam detection. Now, as, as everyone uses email, and spam is definitely a problem. Uh, and so um, spam filters are a very important application of Cisco and machine learning. The data in this, on this table actually, um, I think it's from the, the, maybe the late 90s? Is that before, right? Before, no. Yeah, late 90s, exactly. It's from uh, Hewlett Packard. So this is a, a person named George uh, who worked at Hewlett Packard. So this was early in the days of email where, as well, spam was also not very sophisticated. So what we have here is uh, data from uh, uh, over 4,000 emails sent to an individual named George at HP Labs. Each one's been hand-labeled as either being spam or good email. 
And the goal here is to try to predict. Actually, they call good email ham these days, right? Okay. Um, so the a goal was to try to classify spam from ham based on the, the frequencies of words in the, in, in the email. So here we just have a, a summary table of some of the more important features. So uh, it's based on um, uh, words and characters in the email. So for example, this is saying that if this email had George in it, it was more likely to be good email than spam. Back then, if, uh, if, some, you know, if you saw your name is George and you saw George in your email, it was more likely to be good email. Nowadays, of course, spam is much more um, sophisticated. They know your name, they know a lot about your life, and um, the fact that your name's in actually, it, it may, may be a smaller chance it's actually good email. But back then, this, the spam, spammers were, were much less sophisticated. So, for example, you know, if your name was in it, you're a small chance to be high email. What's with that remove word, Rob? Uh, remove, okay. So I guess it probably says something like don't remove. Is that right? I think it says uh, if you want to be removed yeah. from this list, click. I see. That's usually a spam. Right. So th the goal was that, in, if it, and we'll talk about this example in detail, to use the, the, the 57 features, and here's these are uh, seven of those features, as a classifier together to, to try to predict whether an email is spam or ham. Identify the numbers in a handwritten zip code. This is what we were alluding to earlier. Here's some handwritten um, z digits taken from envelopes. Um, and the, the goal is to, based on an image of any of these digits, to, to say what the digit is, is to, to classify into the 10 digit classes. Well, to humans, this looks like a, a pretty easy task. Um, you know, we're pretty good at pattern recognition. Turns out it's a notoriously difficult task for, for computers. They're getting better and better all the time. So this, this was one of the first learning tasks that was used um, to uh, develop neural networks. Neural networks were first brought to bear on this problem. And uh, you know, we, thought, we thought this should be an easy uh, problem to crack. Turns out it's really difficult. Yeah. Um, Actually, I remember the first time, Trevor, that we worked on a machine learning problem was, was this problem. I, and you were working at Bell Labs, I visited Bell Labs, and you just gotten this data, and you said these people in artificial intelligence are working on this, and that we thought, oh, let's try some statistical methods, and we tried uh, discriminant analysis, right? That's right. And we got an error rate of about 8.5%, and the best error rate in anyone about had, 20 minutes. Right, and the best error rate anyone else had was about 4 or 5% at that point. We thought, oh, this is going to be easy. We're already at 8% in 10 or 15 minutes. <laughs> And six months later? <laughs> six months later, we were maybe at the same place. So we yeah. realized actually, you know, as often as the case, you can get some of the signal pretty quickly, but getting down to a very good error rate. Uh, in this case, trying to, trying to classify some of the harder to classify n things, like maybe the, this four, or actually most of these are pretty easy, but if you, if you, if you look at the, the database, some of them are very hard. So hard that the human eye can't really tell what they are, or it has difficulty. And those are the ones that the machine learning algorithms have, are, have, are, are really challenged by. Anyway, it's a lovely yeah. problem and it's fascinated uh, machine yeah. learners and yeah. statisticians for a long time. So the, the next example comes from, from medicine, classifying a, a tissue sample into, into a, uh, one of several cancer classes based on the gene expression profile. So Trevor and I both work in the medical school part-time here at Stanford, and a lot of what we do and others do is to try to use uh, machine learning, Cisco learning, big data analysis to uh, uh, learn about um, data in cancer and other diseases. So this is an example of that. This is data in breast cancer. It's called gene expression data. So th this has been collected from gene chips. And what we see here on the left is a, a matrix of data. Each row is a gene. And there's about uh, 8,000 genes here, I think. And each column is a patient. And this is called a heat map. So what this heat map is, is representing is low and high gene expression for a given patient for a given gene. So green meaning low and red meaning high. And gene expression means the gene is working. So if a gene is expressing, it's working hard in the cell. If it's not expressing, it's, it's, it's quiet, it's silent. And the, uh, the goal was to try to figure out which genes, well, try to figure out the pattern of gene expression. Uh, these are patients, these are women with, with breast cancer, trying to figure out the common patterns of gene expression for, for women with breast cancer and seeing why there's subcategories of breast cancer showing different gene expression. So we see here's a heat map of the full data, 88 women in the columns and about, again, about 8,000 genes in the rows. And um, hierarchical clustering, which we'll discuss in the last part of this course, has been applied to the columns. And you see the clustering tree at the top here, which has been expanded for your view at the top. And hierarchical clustering has been used to divide these women into roughly one, two, three, four, five, six subgroups based on their gene expression.
They're very effective, especially with these yeah. colors. You can just see these clusters standing out. Yeah. Hierarchical clustering and heat maps actually have been a very important contribution for genomics, which is, this is an example of, simply because it, it, they enable you to see and to organize the full set of data on just in a single picture. And the bottom right here is some more, we've uh, drilled down to, to look more at the, the gene expression, like for example, this subgroup here, these red patients seem to be high largely in these genes and maybe in these genes. So we'll talk about this example in detail later on in the course. Establish the relationship between salary and demographic variables in a population, in population survey data. So here's some survey data. Um, um, we see income from the central Atlantic region of the USA in, in 2009. And you see what you might expect to see as a function of age, income initially goes up, then levels off, and then finally goes down as, as, as people get older. Um, incomes gradually increase with year as the cost of living increases, and incomes change with, with education level. Um, that's the right-hand plot. Those are box plots. And so here we see the, the, the three, in, three of the variables that affect income. And again, the goal is that we use regression models to try and understand the roles of these variables together and see if there's, you know, if there's interactions and so on. And our last example is um, Landsat images of, uh, of land use uh, area in, in Australia. So this is a rural area of Australia. Those are harsh colors, Rob. Did you, did you choose those colors? Uh, you probably did, Trevor. Oh. You're the uh, color This is before I developed taste. <laughs> when did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't see the uh, news memo. Okay, so um, here are, uh, these are from Landsat images. So let's start here in, the, in this panel. So this is, uh, again, uh, a rural area of Australia where the uh, land use has been labeled, I think, actually by um, by graduate students or, or uh, researchers into one of one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, they six, don't have to pay the, the, the graduate students as much <laughs> there as, as right. we do. So they've been labeled, uh, and these colors are indicating the different labels. These are the true labels. And the goal is to try to predict these true labels from um, the uh, spectral bands at four frequencies taken from a... Um, a satellite image, and so here's the f here's the power at the different frequencies uh, in, in four spectral bands. So we have features which are now they're pretty complicated because we have features, spatial features, four layers of them, and we're going to try to use those combination of features to predict the the land use that we see here. And pixel by pixel, right? Pixel by pixel. Yeah. Although we might want to use the fact that nearby pixels are more likely to be the same land use than ones that are far away. And uh, we'll talk about classifiers. I think the one we use here is actually nearest neighbor. It's a very simple classifier, and that produces the prediction in the bottom right. And you can see it's quite good. It's not perfect. There's a few mistakes it makes, but it's, for the most part, quite accurate. Okay, so that's, that's the end of uh, the, the series of examples. In the next session, we'll just uh, tell you some notation and how we set up problems for supervised learning, um, and which we'll use for the rest of the course.